This is the best of first and last, the podcast. Last night, the Cleveland Cavaliers, no more messing around. They close out the series in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics by a pretty substantial margin, 135 to 102, and it felt every bit of that along the way. And it's finally led us here. We've been talking about it, talking over the conference finals about it, talking through basically what has been a very lackluster NBA playoffs about one matchup that we finally get to stare down the barrel of here. The Cleveland Cavaliers, the Golden State Warriors, will face off now for the third consecutive year in the NBA Finals. This is the first time in NBA history that two teams have met in the finals three three straight years. Looking at the world of sport in general, it's actually happened in Major League Baseball, the NHL, and the NFL. However, this will be the first time across the four major North American sports that it's happened after the team split the first two meetings. So this is our first rubber match scenario in a championship setting of any of the four major sports in North America. That's the gravity of this matchup. That's why we've been pointing to this as our beacon in the night, our great hope for what has otherwise been a very underwhelming NBA playoffs, and we'll get to more on that later on as it pertains to some of the antics from one of our favorite content providers and Charles Barkley. But last night was big for a lot of reasons. Certainly, first and foremost, the Cleveland Cavaliers get back to the finals. LeBron James, personally a big night for him. In a few ways, you have, of course, LeBron James now going to his seventh straight NBA Finals, his eighth overall, but seventh straight, certainly an impressive feat. Him and, worth noting, James Jones as well, also his seventh straight NBA Finals. God, does it pay to be close to LeBron and have a skill set that he merits consideration for every team that he's on. You get some interesting work perks that come along with that, but a big night in another even bigger way historically, perhaps, For LeBron James, LeBron scored 35 points last night in Game 5. And in that third quarter, scoring those points, moved past Michael Jordan for the most career playoff points in NBA history. LeBron James now sits atop that list with 5,995 points, passing his Airness, who sat atop before with 5,987 and it was a moment that LeBron James talked and acknowledged, talked about and acknowledged after the game what it meant to him. Well, first of all, you know, I wear the number because of Mike. Uh, I think I fell in love with the game because of Mike, just seeing what he was able to accomplish. Um, but I felt like Mike was so, you know, when you're growing up and you're seeing Michael Jordan, you, you, it's almost like a god. So I didn't never believe I could be Mike. So I started to focus myself on other players and, and other people around my neighborhood um, because I never thought that you could get to a point where Mike was. Um, so I think that helped shape my game. And um, I think the, the biggest thing for me sitting here today after breaking the all-time scoring record in playoff history is that um, I did it just being me. I don't, I don't have to score – the ball to make an impact in a basketball game. And that was my mindset. You know, when I started playing the game, I was like, if I'm not scoring the ball, how can I still make an impact on the game? And um, it's carried me all the way to this point now. And it's going to carry me for the rest of my career uh, because scoring is, um, is not number one on my agenda. And that's really been the hallmark of LeBron James' career has been this idea and this dedication to playing the game the only way he knows how, which is, in his mind, making the right basketball play over and over. It's why you get stat lines like last night where, yes, 35 points is what jumps off the page, especially after a Game 3 where he came under heavy scrutiny. But eight rebounds, eight assists, three steals, throw a block in there. Filling up the stat sheet the way LeBron always has will be what defines his greatness. LeBron James' stat line, really in the assist column, for me, is what's always going to define LeBron, the greatness of LeBron's career. Because much like the people that watch the Showtime Lakers, and in the last few days, the Magic Johnson comparison has come back out of the woodwork. It's something that we've sent through the spin cycle here more than enough times. 
But for people that talk back glowingly about the Showtime Lakers and you see the highlights of the things Magic was able to do, that's the level that you see from LeBron. And you understand that that's not just physical ability, but an understanding of the game that's so unique to these all-time greats. And it's been so unique to what we've watched for LeBron James. And he uh, you know, continued to talk about how scoring wasn't the only thing that he does for this team. I don't have to score the ball to make an impact in a basketball game. And that was my mindset. You know, when I started playing the game, I was like, if I'm not. My bad. That's the same cut. Ah, uh, well, well, darn it. It was still on my little board here. What are you going to do? <laughs> the point being, LeBron James, awesome passer. That'll be Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. Straight Talk Wireless nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable networks. And it's almost strange to hear that kind of introspective discussion around LeBron James heading into the finals. Because you remember, oh, by the way, despite the fact that Ty Lue may have said that he believes the Celtics were throwing better stuff, better sets at them than the Golden State Warriors, none of us really believe that to be true. And yet you had this moment where LeBron was even able to step back in the midst of this pursuit and acknowledge this bit of a place in history that he now presides over. As it pertains to looking forward towards the finals now, you've got maybe a more relaxed LeBron James. Maybe that's why he's able to take the focus off that for a second, but some of his teammates, including Kevin Love, who's had a big series, and we'll talk about more certainly as we look forward towards the finals, talked about just how much this series against the Celtics helped and got them ready for the next team that they'll face. The Celtics and you know, Brad Stevens, their team that, that they have, they, they run a – there are a lot of different – a lot of different lineups at you and a lot of different you know, stuff on the offensive end. So, um, you know, as far as how they play, I think it, it definitely uh, prepared us for what's ahead. And um, – it was, uh, you know, definitely a hard-fought series, and even when they lost Isaiah, um, you know, they didn't lay down, and you know, that's a big testament to them. They, I mentioned inspired basketball that we play. They, they definitely played inspired basketball, not only here but in our arena. Going to be very important going forward. Going to be very. Kevin Love's going to continue to be very important going forward for this team. By the way, we got enamored with him stuffing the part of the stat sheet that involves points a few games ago, but between that, the rebounds, and just Kevin Love's overall improved attitude. This has been a guy that's kind of like Chris Bosh in the Miami Big Three has really had to take a back seat to a lot of the rest of these guys understanding that what LeBron and what Kyrie bring to the team is a lot more demonstrative than what Kevin Love has traditionally brought, but he's been a guy who this series really has asserted himself in a way that should absolutely give Cavaliers fans a lot to look forward to going into this final series because we remember closeout Kevin Love last year in the finals finding a way to D up on the perimeter in a way that affected the outcome of the series in a big way and was memorable for a guy that's not totally known for his defensive prowess. Starting to see shades of that showing up again and at the very perfect time. First and last, the podcast. We got some tweets coming in last night. The Cavaliers. Finish the series off against the Celtics. They now set us up for Cavs versus Warriors Part 3, but it was a big night for LeBron James, past Michael Jordan on the all-time playoff scoring list, which prompted at DJ Mills to tweet into us, LeBron leading the playoffs in scoring is misleading. He played more games. The first round used to be 3 of 5. He has many playoff losses. Yes. We are all aware of this fact. Everyone made note of it leading up to this, that it's taken LeBron a great deal more games than it took Michael to get to this scoring margin. Understood. Loud loud and clear. That all absolutely plays a part in this. It's worth acknowledging. I don't think it changes a ton of the fact of how impressive this is because you can spin a lot of that a certain number of ways, like, Yes, certainly certainly that changed, but you're still dealing with a comparable amount. Let's look at uh, Dave McMenamin had a couple good tweets as it pertained to this last night about LeBron James and how we contextualize a lot of this. Like LeBron James, again, a guy that we don't traditionally think of as a three-point shooter, passed Michael Jordan for first in postseason scoring. He hit three threes in a row in that third quarter, and on that third one he passed Mono Ginobili for third on the all-time list in postseason threes as well. 
Again, not a guy we typically think of in that vein, but has still been productive. Michael Jordan, we all know, six for six in the finals in 15 career seasons. LeBron James is about to have his eighth finals trip in 14 years. So there's still something to be said for that level of production within that body of work, within that time. Yes, it's taken more games. Yes, he's continually gotten his team deep in these postseason runs. So I think there's still a lot that's impressive in there, and that comparison is going to always be hard to escape. For LeBron James, mostly because he courts it, and that's self-admittedly. And he talked at length about the many ways that he wanted to be like Jordan growing up, and maybe one way he didn't. Take a listen. I did pretty much everything that MJ did when I was a kid. I shot fadeaways before I should have. I I wore a leg sleeve on my leg and folded it down so you saw the red part. For no reason. I wore black and red shoes with white socks. I wore short shorts so you could see my undershorts underneath. I didn't go bald like Mike, but uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> but I'm getting there. <laughs> but it'd be post career, though. Uh, that's the only thing I didn't do. If you are anywhere where you can get to a screen, whether it is phone, computer, or the like, and find video of that moment in the press conference, please mind Tristan Thompson's face in the background as LeBron, in a very self aware moment, Attacks his much scrutinized hairline. For as highly scrutinized as LeBron James has been as a player, I think you can add that and then some to his ever-changing hairline. Because there's been some sorcery that's gone on there. As Bamani Jones has often said about other folks, LeBron seems to have been out here cheating at certain times with the hairline. And listen, he's got money and time, money to spend and time to blow, so I don't blame him necessarily for that as someone who suffers from similar problems. Yeah, we need to get more into that. Go like you you can you can relate. Oh, listen, this is as I've often said, the one area where me and LeBron have a lot in common. Outside of at one point in time having been elite level athletes, we also have hairlines that have hit a strong back pedal earlier and later. Now LeBron James, thirty two years old, a little more excusable at that point than twenty seven year old me sitting here wondering where both the time and the hair have gone. Did you just sneaky compare your athletic careers? No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Felt like it was warranted. A lot to look back on. We'll reflect on my athletic achievements at some point down the road. But in the meantime, LeBron James had his own achievements of his own. But now it's his achievements, his success, have led us to what we all wanted. And now starting to look ahead of this matchup, feel kind of compelled to look back because we talk about Golden State coming out and saying the Cavaliers took something from us that we believe is ours. That seems to be the sentiment going into that game, and it was summed up rather perfectly, rather, let's say, predictively back in October by, wait for it, let me surprise you here, Draymond Green. If Cleveland comes out of the East, I want to destroy Cleveland. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. But I also know that there are steps to get to that point. And if and when we get to that point, I want to annihilate them. Didn't really mince words. That's from October of this past fall, October 2016. Draymond Green already going on record saying, hey, this is exactly what we're looking for. Make no mistake about our motivation. We have listened to an entire offseason of 3-1 lead jokes. We became the laughing stock of the league. And everything that we've done since then has been about getting back to this moment. Everything that they've done since then has been chasing the ghost of that lost championship. A year after a championship for Golden State that got an asterisk of sorts put by it saying that they had an easy road to go through. They got a lot of teams dealing with injury, including the Cavaliers in that final. They've got a style of play that's been as scrutinized as anything else and were likable for all of what felt like five minutes were the Golden State Warriors before the tides even started to turn against them on that. They became too arrogant. Draymond Green became this source of dirty play and ire that a lot of people like to always look at and constantly throw shade his way and so all of that has led us back to this moment and it's actually interesting to me the way it sets up for this finals now because you've got the chain 
I'd say you finally removed a lot of the excuses that were there. That first year, you had that excuse for Cleveland side. Well, Kyrie and Kevin Love are both out. LeBron James is out there with the Island of Misfit Toys. Delhi is basically paying second fiddle. And as important as Delhi was to this team, not necessarily your traditional number two. Next year, you've got Draymond Green missing a big-time game in the midst. Some would say the swing game of that finals because of suspension now is a suspension that was basically a lifetime achievement, a playoff achievement award for him and the body of work he had put together in the OKC series, kicking people in the you-know-where. And even that, you had Steph that had come off some injuries, etc. The one thing that really changed going into this year, yeah, they added Kevin Durant on that side, but both teams have been overwhelmingly healthy throughout this playoff run. Both teams are healthy at the right time. And that's a skill, as we've seen a lot of teams that they have faced in their wake. Whether it's the Spurs in the Western Conference, as recently as the Conference Finals, you saw a lot of this. And now it gets interesting, and this is, I, I was very interested when I saw this tweet come in before, at RealMikeC49 tweets in, the Warriors and the Cavs have now played in three straight finals, and if you're looking for what the difference is and what the potential excuse could be on one side here if things go sideways, is this will be the third different coaching matchup in these finals. You had Blatt versus Kerr in uh, finals number one. You had Lou versus Kerr in finals number two. And you'll have Lou versus Mike Brown on the side of the Warriors because we're still not sure of the status of Steve Kerr at this point. And that's something that we've sort of pushed to the side because of the Warriors' experience in this area coming up. But when the lights shine the brightest tend to be when things like this show up the most. First and last... Cavs Warriors Part 3, unprecedented rubber match in the world of North American sports. We're excited for it, but let's be honest, last night came in similar fashion in the NBA that we'd seen the entire playoffs up to it. Blowout win, largely non-competitive, and really over before the third quarter was over. So we had a lot of time on our hands. And what have we done in that time throughout the course of this postseason? We've turned to our friends over in the NHL, who time in and time out have found a way to deliver for us, and last night was no exception. Game 7, Eastern Conference Finals, a Senators team that talent-wise, not even in the same ballpark as the Pittsburgh Penguins, and yet had battled to a Game 7 matchup that took two overtimes to decide. Lived up to every bit of what we could want. Game 7, Eastern Conference Finals, you think, all right, we've all, we've already been given more than we deserve. And yet they went out and delivered, and it was entertaining the entire bit of the way. Pittsburgh could never seem to really pull away. 20 seconds after their first goal, Ottawa evens it. Pulls it to even, gives us two overtimes, and the war of attrition that this game turned into was just incredible. You look over at the shots of these guys on the sideline, and these are stars, Crosby, Malkin, the rest of these guys over there on the bench just looking gassed, just trying to find a way to keep going in their short spurts on the ice, whittling down these shifts to a point where they felt like they could go and, and again, give the all the credit in the world. I mean, hockey. Chris Kunitz, they mentioned his first goal this postseason, a 37-year-old who going into this, I, I love the line, looking on .com, looking at the recap of the game last night, it says the first line is Chris Kuhn had spent a portion of this spring nursing a lower body injury and wondering if the time, his time with the Pittsburgh Penguins was over. Nursing a lower body injury. That, to me, is hockey in sort of a nutshell. Nondescript injuries, guys working through it, playing well into their career, continuing to chase this kind of greatness. And when you're looking for greatness in this realm, you really have to look no further than the Penguin star, Sidney Crosby, who was a part of that final goal and talked about what it means to be going back to the Cup with our own Linda Cohn after the game. Was that the most intense game you've ever been a part of? Uh, up there. I mean, Game 7 with uh, you know the stakes, what they were. I think um, double overtime, you know, losing the lead a couple times. It was uh, an emotional game, and we just had to stay with it. Um, Anderson was, was unbelievable uh, again tonight, and we just had to find ways to, to get that next one. Sydney, how did you guys keep your composure watching Anderson being unbelievable, especially in that first overtime? Uh, fortunately, probably 
uh, saw it before in the series. So I think we just knew we had to stay patient, and we knew as soon as we started cheating for offense, uh, they could make you pay. So um, they didn't need a lot of room or time to, to create offense, and uh, we just needed, you know, we didn't make sure that we didn't beat ourselves. So I thought we did a good job of that. Um, but yeah, that's that's a big goal from Cooney there. Let's talk about Cooney, shall we? Thirty-seven years old, the oldest player to score an overtime goal in a game seven. You've known him and played with him for so many years. Tell us what makes him so special. Um, I think he just understands what it takes to win. I think he understands that there's a lot of things that you got to do that go unnoticed or maybe don't show up on the stat sheet, but he's willing to do those things every night. Um, He's a competitor. Uh, I think that you know, it's it's not a fluke that he shows up in the big games uh, the way he does. I think he brings so much to our team on and off the ice, and uh, you know, to have a, a night like he did and, and score a big one like that, um, it's it's great to see. You're five and two in Game Sevens, and now you're going back to a Stanley Cup Final for consecutive years yet again. How do you feel? Uh, it's exciting. You know, you know what? It's a great opportunity, and whether it's back to back or however many times. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to be able to play for the Stanley Cup. That's what you work hard for. Um, you know, that's that's your goal when you start at the start of the year. And um, you know, we found a way with the injuries and everything we've been through to get back there. So we've got to take advantage of it. And they will try and take advantage of it and really accomplish something and be the first team since the 1998 Detroit Red Wings to win back-to-back titles. So have a chance to do something historic. That finals matchup now, the final matchup, excuse me, that we have now heading into the Stanley Cup was a subject that came up with our own Barry Melrose, who was asked who he is rooting for coming up in this NHL Stanley Cup final. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Pitch, Pittsburgh's won the Stanley Cup. I, I, w- I would like to see Nashville win. I, 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 I love what they've done. I love the style of play they play with. Uh, I love the, the, the excitement they have created in Nashville. I love the frenzy that the fans have. Uh, it's new so, new to these guys. It's fresh to these guys. I, I like to see that enthusiasm. So uh, I, I certainly wouldn't mind seeing Nashville Predators carry the cup around. And he's not the only one. There was a tweet almost right after the game by... Columbus Blue Jackets center Brandon Dubinsky, who the Penguins beat in the playoffs, that said simply, let's go at Preds NHL, which of course caused him to get a lot of flack, people calling him salty. So he followed it up with, didn't know being a at Preds NHL fan came along with such hate. Good night, everyone. Preds Nation, look out. Apparently you are under fire. Come there and circle the wagons around one of your own. Where are you on a guy rooting against the team that knocked him out? All for it. I love a good bit of petty in my sports. Because there are two different camps in that. They're saying, well, you want to say that you lost to the eventual champion. But that sort of depends on what the temperature is like in the room with you in that given team. Like, listen, if I if going back to my college days, if we had lost to USC, would I have wanted to see them win the national championship? Hell no. I don't like those guys. And so if he doesn't like the Pens and he wants to go and root hard for Smashville, be my guest. Step right up to the petty plate and take a chop. Yeah, I mean, you get to say you lost to the eventual national champion. Yeah, quite directly. <laughs> that one's that one's a little different. Appreciate the constant reminder, as always, Dan. But we if did. you were in the playoff and you'd lost to them in the semifinal, let's say, rooting for or against in the championship game, Alabama, in this case. Uh, in that case, in that case, probably four because I never really had any sort of vested vested beef with that team. Again, it's a lot different when it hits close to home, and if this hits close to home for him, I get it because insert USC or Michigan into that, and I am instantly wearing the other team's colors. I remember leading up to that game when it came to Alabama, we had Auburn fans sending us leprechauns done up in the Auburn Tigers colors. I mean, you had the you had LSU fans with the Go Irish, the G E A U X. That's how on board, that's the level of hate you were dealing with in those veins. So again, I'm all here for that. But what I'm really interested in, and like you said, this is a time for hockey guy to insert himself. We had a tweet from uh, at Mr. BP BP Connolly. Tweets, the NHL needs three days to start the finals. The NBA needs a week. And that constant comparison between the NHL and the NBA has been interesting because it makes you wonder with how lopsided the NBA playoffs have been, with how great the NHL playoffs have been, 
Has this been an opening for the NHL? You look at this sport that gives us such compelling action night in and night out, especially in the postseason, and what a lot of people will tell you is the most difficult postseason trophy to win in Lord Stanley's Cup, and you look around and you wonder why hockey isn't able to get more of a foothold. Yes, it's got a deeply passionate fan base, but why nationally it's not talked about more and why the numbers surrounding viewership, et cetera, don't reflect that more. Well, you know I'm a huge hockey guy, but to respond to that tweet, it's a little unfair because we had a Game 7 and a Game 6 in the NHL, and the NBA Conference Finals wrapped up in 4 and 5, so of course there's going to be a gap. Like I think these things are fairly pre-scheduled. Yeah, no, I mean, you can you can skew it that way if you'd like to, and it works well for Hockey Guy's argument, who typically points to a lot of this stuff when we've talked about the second night of back-to-backs and playing games in short body periods of time and the physicality because hockey, no one will dispute, is markedly more physical and they work a comparable amount of games into the same time period. But yeah, right, that one, those, those things are, are set in stuff. Well, I mean, to that, to that point, the best player in the playoffs is Eric Carlson, the uh, Ottawa Senators defenseman who it's... It stinks we're not going to be able to watch him play in the cup final, although I feel like in Ottawa-Nashville uh, final, a lot of people probably wouldn't have watched. But I bet you it comes out in the next couple of days that he's headed for surgery almost immediately. Well, that's like the tradition, unlike any other, every year as part of the NHL playoffs is what were these guys playing with? Like who's out there just on some shattered ankle or a completely just broken bone, torn ligament? It's you wait for it to filter out after every team's postseason run is over. It's the handshake line that we all love so much, and then finding out, all right, what was upper body or lower body injury really referring to in all of this. But it, it just baffles me, and I don't know if it was the it's the fact that hockey made a choice a long time ago where they wanted to broadcast their games. I mean, we had the joke last night. I saw Frank Isola, Charles Barkley was referencing the NHL finals during the TNT broadcast saying the NBA game was so lopsided he was going to go back to the hotel and watch the end of the game, which found out later in some other tweets, apparently Charles had bet Ottawa in that game, so had a little bit of money riding on it. But Frank Isola mentioned that Charles Barkley during that broadcast had pubbed the NHL more than the NHL network at that point. And I feel like hockey at times can suffer from a bit of a PR problem to where we were watching these games on NBC Sportsnet, which, you know, no offense to that network, but it's just a little bit harder to find than it should be at this time of year for your biggest marquee product. And hockey guy, speaking again from experience, is a lot like soccer guy, which is like you want the sport to be popular because you love it, but at the same time, you still kind of dig the fact that it's not embraced and you're kind of part of a, an elite little group. Well, it's the band before they sell out, quote unquote. And it's just like, so that's my place with lacrosse would be my sport for that one. We're coming up on championship weekend for college lacrosse, and I make the bid for people every year to check check it out. You'll enjoy it. It has so many elements of games that you love. Why not check it out? At least for lacrosse, I can remind myself that comparatively along the timeline of its you know entrance into the main you know marquee venue of sports and the big time stage, it's soup. It's a newborn. It is so relatively young compared to the rest of these sports. Hockey doesn't have that excuse, and so that's why we keep searching for answers there. First and last. An interesting story out of the NFL yesterday. Our own Seth Wickersham wrote a story that's going to be in ESPN the Magazine coming up in June. Wrote a story about Richard Sherman and his tumultuous offseason. We know that... He was dangled out. The Seahawks were taking calls on trades for him. Richard Sherman was willing to be traded, it sounded like, from all accounts. But how we can really trace a lot of that back to that Seattle loss on the one-yard line and the Malcolm Butler interception. And all of these sort of cracks in the foundation that we've really started to see since then. And it's really interesting because a lot of it delves not only into the relationship of Richard Sherman with the coaching staff that had come under fire, but their quarterback and Russell Wilson as well, which is really interesting to get the outside perspective. Now, we've seen players come out and already say that you know they're not really buying into this, but Seth Wickersham was on the Rosillo show yesterday and talked about some of that bad blood that exists between the Seahawks, the players, and their head coach, Pete Carroll, in a way that we didn't really think about all that much before. Here it is. 
A lot of players, they want him to apologize. It would be they, they feel like they don't have closure, and Pete's not going to do that. Pete doesn't think he made a bad call. The outcome turned out bad, but Pete doesn't think he made the bad call. And Bill Belichick has backed him up more than a lot of his own players have on that. That in reference to the goal line play, the Malcolm Butler interception of the one in that Super Bowl, which sounds funny when you think about it. Of course Bill Belichick's going to back up that play. If I'm Bill Belichick, I'm standing up there. You know what? If, we find our, if they ever found themselves in that same situation again against us, and they've got the choice. If I'm Pete, I'm doing it 100 out of 100 times again. Throw that pass. Make sure you throw it right at Malcolm again, too. That's such an amazing quote. Bill Belichick has told Pete Carroll, like, it was the right call. Bet he did. Hashtag duh. I bet, I bet he did. And, like, at this point, we can all recognize that wasn't the right call. You get there with the one that got you there. And Marshawn Lynch, as much as this is Russell Wilson's team by nature of salary... Marshawn Lynch was the engine that made that thing go. Beast mode made it happen, and so you give the ball to him on the one-yard line. I get that you had gotten stuffed a couple of times before, and the coaches that came out in this article and put their name on it said, if we just execute that play, it's a walk-in. And Malcolm Butler had a superhuman effort. Yeah, don't be a victim of uh, hindsight, Mike Golick Jr. What are you talking about? You can't say that was the wrong call. Listen. You're not. You, that's a mindset thing for me. Like as an offensive lineman, I'm always going to believe that in a goal to go situation or fourth and one situation, put it on us. That's just that's a mentality, and that's a mentality usually of winning football teams. And usually, when I think you could make a very strong argument, Marshawn Lynch was still their best player at that point. So game on the line, goal to go, one yard line. You put the ball in your best player's hands. You hand it off, and you remove a lot of those things there. Unless you're going to do a rollout pass that buys you time and does other stuff, I get that you that was a play that you thought could work, but that one's one even in the moment you're saying why didn't they hand it off? This isn't something that years later I'm looking back on the way Richard Sherman has. I understand that, but advanced statistics show that that slant, quick slant play on fourth and short or fourth and goal are uh, very successful, highly successful, very high percentage play. Is it higher percentage than handing the ball off to Marshawn Lynch? According to them, not getting in on the play before it. Listen, that's you know what that's going to always just be, I guess, a an ideological difference for a lot of people. And again, considering my past, but I think the interesting thing here is that they point back to that moment as the one that's really been part of the undoing for Richard Sherman and his relationship with the coaches. They talked about the disdain that some have for Russell Wilson. They don't believe he's graded on the same curve that the defense is, that Richard Sherman and company are over there. They think that a lot of them get a pass and get off a little bit easy from Pete Carroll. And I can understand that aspect of it because we understand that not everyone gets traded, treated equally in the locker room, but at the same time, when it shows up in glaring examples time after time again, players' ears go up immediately on that. And you understand, and it down it. You take the coach's message then and you downgrade a little bit from there on out because you don't believe you're getting true honesty. But if I'm being honest reading this article, they're trying to point back to that moment as this is where the cracks started to show. Now, this is where you expose the cracks. If you've got a team that's not going to be able to stay together through all these moments and the Seahawks, Seahawks can lock arms all they want before the anthem, the bottom line is a lot of this stuff seemed to have been there before. And it was under the guise of, yeah, well, we're finding a way to win. The competition drives performance. Nah, this stuff was always there, and you just stopped having the result on the other end that allowed you to mask a lot of that smell. It's going to be very interesting to see now. Watch the Seahawks this year, because this doesn't smell good for me, for them. Sorry for Mina Kimes, another Seahawks fan, but it could be rough for you. First and last, the podcast. I sit around the rest of the day, and I consume a fair amount of sports talk radio and other forms of sports media on our air. And I sat there and was talking with a friend about how really the NBA playoffs, we've been running the same few storylines for a while now because the games themselves have been relatively uninteresting. And so we've kept looking forward. We've kept projecting out. We've kept talking hypothetically about what this finals could look like, what this finals could mean, and how much is really riding on it at this point in the NBA playoffs, but so far, if we look at recent history in the last two years, this matchup has shown us that it's willing and able to shoulder the load in a major way. Someone who talked about that and really the way that only he can, our own Stephen A. Smith. 
You are the reigning, defending NBA champion, and these boys are calling you out because they're claiming you have what truly belongs to them. If you are a superstar, if you are the best in the world, you answer that call. You don't try to change the narrative and shove it aside so you have minimal pressure to perform. Embrace the pressure. Embrace the moment. Show us what you got. Show us why. Under these circumstances, and then all of us have no choice but to shut up when you've embraced that challenge and you've conquered the best team in the NBA, which the Golden State Warriors were throughout this season. I can't wait. No one can wait. But this is the reason why. Not because one team is so considerably better than the other and it's lopsided. No, these are the two elite teams in the NBA. No excuses at all. Producer guy Dan made a very good point as we were listening to the sound before the show, which is that Stephen A. has this unique ability to, when you think, and you can usually tell tone-wise, volume-wise, when someone's getting ready to wind down with a thought, Stephen A. gives you the the okey-doke. He gives you that head fake there and reminds you, quite simply, that there is simply levels to this. And he's on top for that reason, amongst many others. But it's interesting, too, with that sound in particular, talking about what LeBron James faces in this finals, the part, the side, the narrative that he encapsulates, you could have taken that sound and played it last year and it would have been exactly the same. Like, I I forget who I heard talking about it yesterday, but the idea that when's the last time that LeBron had been an underdog? Last year's finals. The finals the year before that. Every time he's faced Golden State on this big stage, LeBron James, who we've talked about as one of the all-time greats, had that debate all postseason, has been the underdog in every one of these Golden State Cleveland finals, will be again is the underdog going away in this finals right now uh, as the odds. Westgate Las Vegas Superbook installed Golden State as a minus 260 favorite to win the finals with Cleveland at plus 220. According to ESPN Stats and Info, LeBron will enter the finals as an underdog for the sixth time in eight career appearances. So let that marinate in the continued LeBron-Jordan debate. How many times, I'd be interested to look back how many times Michael Jordan's Bulls teams were underdog in those underdogs in those six finals. Because that comparison comes up in a lot of different ways over the course of this postseason. Last night it came up again because LeBron James, in a big night for him personally, passed Michael Jordan on the all-time playoff career points list. LeBron now sits atop that list with 5,995 points. And a lot of people would point to that and have, and understandably so, and said, well, the earlier rounds in those playoffs required fewer games. They were best three of five. It took LeBron James a considerable number of games more to reach that marker, to reach that accomplishment in his time period. What Jordan defenders tend to leave out is the fact that LeBron James passed Michael Jordan with around 120 fewer shots attempt, shot attempts in that time period, so fewer shots to get to that point, even if by a per-game basis, it was a lot more on his side. And that's what I mean. The framework for these arguments matters. And the framework going into the finals of LeBron James being an underdog for the sixth out of eight times. And by the way, worth noting too in that one that Michael Jordan, six six uh, finals appearances in 15 seasons. I saw this tweet from Dave McMenamin. LeBron James, eight finals appearance in 14 seasons. So consistently getting his team there. And I guess I understand the Eastern Conference. Maybe he hasn't been the strong suit top to bottom during that time period. But it's still worth noting that LeBron James has faced an uphill battle in a lot of these situations. And while he doesn't have that perfect six for six record, that Michael Jordan gets to lord over everyone, what he's been able to do in these situations, what he's been able what he was able to do last year against that Golden State team is historically all time impressive. You basically took the team that beat the regular season win record of those Michael Jordan Bulls, you took that team and went out and toppled that giant last year. You stole two games from them in a series that really you had no business being in the year before when the Golden State won their first title, and now you get the rubber match in it this year that really for LeBron James, that legacy got cemented last year. That was all the talk coming off of last year's finals was that, all right, that was LeBron's come, come mess with me moment. Come see me now 
in my all-time legacy. I came back and delivered the title I wanted, but like we like to do in the world of sports and like we like to do with him, we'll move the goalpost back now and we'll say this can be the one that really cements it in a way. But for LeBron James, you already had that. You already had that deep breath moment for LeBron that he got to enjoy. Now he's playing relaxed coming into this, but understands that there's still more to chase. If CheatSheet.com is to be believed... Listen, it's the internet. You can trust everything on the internet. An underdog has won the NBA Finals six times. Twice LeBron has done it. Michael Jordan never did it. Something that Mike... That can't be right. Michael Jordan did everything. Michael Jordan did everything. He also... I don't... That stat I read before has to be wrong, too, because Michael Jordan never missed shots. But, for the Jordan camp, one of the other times an underdog won in the Finals was the Mavericks over LeBron. Yes, and... That one brought up over and over again, rightly so, is the truest and, I'd say, deepest low point of LeBron James' career. And he's ap- going to have to answer that. No way, no two ways about it. It's sort of interesting, though, when you think about it, if that's true, that six times in NBA history, an underdog has won the finals, and LeBron has been involved in half of them. Twice on the winning side, once yeah. on the losing side. Isn't that interesting? It really it, to to have won a third of those instances and to have overcome and it speaks to exactly what we say looking at this series now, which is that Golden State should win this going away. Vegas clearly believes that. But we always give Cleveland a chance because they've got one guy. We always understand that what Le- team LeBron James has been on seven straight finals now is going to be there. We can talk about Kyrie, Kevin Love, we can talk about Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. But there has been one common denominator in the last seven NBA Finals appearances from the Eastern Conference side, and that common denominator has been LeBron James. And the common denominator in those underdog wins has been LeBron James. That's not an accident. It also speaks to how difficult a time we have in pinning down LeBron in that we overrate him sometimes, we underrate him sometimes, we never can quite put our finger on what exactly he is or what he can or can't do in the biggest moment. Well, and public perception has a lot to do with that just because of the way LeBron James has conducted himself off the court at time. You had to deal with the ramifications of the decision in that press conference in Miami to where he became this lovable phenom in Cleveland and then went on to become the villain in Miami in a way that people hated for a lot of years. And then somewhere along the line, Golden State stole that mantle the year they won the title. And they became this team that instead of being lovable and homegrown and a lot of the things that NBA fans claim to love, they went away from that. That narrative shifted and they became the villain in a way that made LeBron endearing when he won that 3-1 final, when he went back home to make good on what he had promised so long ago. First and last. I understand we have a particularly fired up voice hanging out in the Shell Penzo performance line. Let's go to KJ in Los Angeles. KJ, you're on first and last. What's going on, man? How you doing, man? First time caller. I've been watching the NBA for a very, very long time, so I'm no kid. Uh, I've been listening to the next Jordan for the last 25 years. It's enough already. I mean, even the great LeBron James is not even in the vicinity of Michael Jordan. Now, numbers-wise, yes, because of his longevity. But I got to ask you guys something, and I hope you guys let me finish. Uh, the the half truths have got to stop. And if you know the definition of a half truth, you know what it means. It's it. it you, you're deceiving the public. Would, you're, that, you're would, that, be not a, would that be not a whole and truth? Not, and you're not saying is that the other half truth is? Let, let me, yeah, let me explain to you what, what you're doing. You're doing what a <laughs> lot of the media does. You're saying what a great comeback LeBron did in the 3-1 to one series, but you're not saying why. He was averaging 23 points a game his first four games of, of the series with four turnovers a game at 47%. All of a sudden, when Draymond Green gets suspended – uh, uh, Iggy, Andre Iguodala gets sprains his back or has his back spasms in game six. Rim protecting defensive specialist Andrew Bogut, who no longer can protect the rim. All three of those players are gone, and he just magically, don't ask me how, maybe he's David Copperfield, but he magically went from 23 points a game to 41 points a game in back to back games. But all we'll hear from the media is how LeBron came back from a three to one deficit. They won't say the other side. And it drives me insane. There's a re- for every action, there's a reaction. And it wasn't because of LeBron's greatness, which he is great, don't get me wrong. But there is another side. And I just, I'm just wondering why they don't say the other side. Now, let me go to the other part that I'm talking about. And when you sit there and say that 
LeBron James beat Michael Jordan in scoring in less shot attempts in the playoffs. You don't mention how, a tr- I mean, literally, I've been watching the NBA since 1980. It is the worst I have ever seen it in my entire life. If Jordan played in this Eastern Conference, he'd be averaging 50. You know this. If you've been watching even, Jordan, even you though, would know that he would average 50 in this conference. Even though Look Michael Jordan, Jordan came out and said himself that in today's NBA, with the way defenses are played, he wouldn't have been nearly as effective? His, he said his, that his, back his in an article mine. when he was trying to get the rules changed. But let me ask you this. I'm about to prove you wrong. Oh, let's see. I'm, oh, are you ready? Yes. How, how, did the rule, how, did, how are the rules stopping LeBron? How are the rules stopping Kobe's 81 when they play the 1 2 2 zone against him? How, did, how, did this, how are the rules stopping Mike, uh, uh, excuse me, Russell Westbrook and, and James Harden? The rules aren't working too well. So Michael Jordan was wrong, wasn't he? About what? And let me ask you this Did Michael Jordan ever play with three or four, literally four, uh, stretch board, uh, uh, what they call it now? Did he ever play with four three-point shooters on the court at the same time that opened up the lane like Moses parted the Red Sea? I mean, this, this, you know how many dunks LeBron James had in game one? He had uh, 12 dunks and four layups. This is what happens when the spacing today is so great that it opens up the lane like literally Moses parted the Red Sea. And you're going to tell me that Jordan numbers wouldn't have been greater today? This is not this is not rocket science, bro. Guy, he's taking a really long time to say a whole lot of stuff we've already heard before. This is great. I I was actually taking notes during that call. Yeah, just this, to, uh, this got really interesting. Get like a checklist of what we got there. Yeah, uh, we got a lesson on media. Yeah, no definition of half truths. By the way, for those of you who don't understand what a half truth is, he said for those of you who know it and then never defined it. So that's good too. So that was the other thing we got. Uh, sort of a vocabulary lesson. It was like a half vocabulary lesson. Yeah. Uh, we Incomplete. got we got an obvious lesson on basketball from a guy who's been watching it since 1980, so that was cool. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know that he's watched a lot of basketball. This is bad. It's bad stuff we're seeing right now. We got a history lesson on Jordan and the 90s basketball. We got a statistics lesson. We got a science lesson on the every reaction has a as a reaction. Yeah, Newton. Shout out to Newton, Isaac Newton, making yep. some laws. We got some great references. We got an Andrew Bogut reference in there, which was cool. But then it got way better. We got a David Copperfield reference. You don't often get talking about magic this early in the morning. We could use more of that. Seamlessly transitioned from magic to a biblical reference, and he went Moses on us. Moses, old some Old Testament stuff right there. That was an Old Testament style rant too. A lot of fire and brimstone. In that he was particularly fired up. If we did like an end of the year wrap up show, like I don't know that call of the year would even need any competitors. No, he he wins that one going away, and he did it sort of in a very Stephen A. esque manner, where I think tone and his own passion really drove it to be something that, in his case, really wasn't much of anything new. Like, oh, Michael Jordan would have thrived in this era. LeBron James couldn't play back then. Basketball is a watered-down product right now. All of these things that we've heard over and over again. Referencing Draymond Green going out in the finals last year being a turning point in that series. Really, no one's mentioned that before. Apparently, he's been watching a lot more basketball and listening to a lot less sports talk radio and missed that somewhere along the way. First and last. The podcast took a call in the last segment that has lit my mentions on fire. And it's pretty split down the middle at this point. We took a caller who rebuked the notion that LeBron James is anywhere near the discussion of Michael Jordan. For those of you who may have missed it last night, LeBron James and the Cavaliers end the Eastern Conference Finals 4 1 series win over the Boston Celtics. And in that process, LeBron James passed Michael Jordan in the all time career playoff point list. He is now sits number one overall in that moment and in what's become pretty commonplace for this debate, for this discussion and conversation, those of the old guard take any comparison whatsoever as a direct affront to their entire being. And it's strange to me. I, I can understand it to an extent because people identify, like I look forward to 20, 30 years from now when we're having the same discussion about LeBron James. When we're defending him in a similar fashion. That's not to say people don't defend him now, but we always defend the past a little more vigorously than we defend the present. We'd rather talk about a meal we enjoyed 20 years ago than enjoy the food we're eating right now. 
that's just kind of the way we are about things. And so in 20 or 30 years when LeBron James has come and passed and long since been a Hall of Famer and, and finished accomplishing anything on the court and we've got that next new flavor, he's going to be the guy that we as the current generation now in the prime of our lives and the prime of our sports viewing careers defend vigorously because he represents the time that we hold near and dear. So it's I, I see it as somewhat cyclical in that sense. Now, Michael Jordan is a bit of an outlier because he did a lot of things for basketball at that time in the 90s that were in large part why the sport is so popular today. He brought a branding and a culture to the NBA that has long since persisted even after he stopped dribbling. And it's important to know, I mean, that guy literally told us, I started watching basketball in 1980. Michael Jordan entered the league in 1984. So, again, it's something we've talked about before on the show, which is that every one of these callers who calls in to defend Jordan almost always starts with, I grew up watching Jordan, or somehow that's the basketball, basically the NBA that you learned and now everything past it, this new NBA, the caller mentioned a bunch of times about how the NBA is different now and the spacing on the floor and LeBron can get into the lane, blah, 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 blah. And we kind of made fun of him. And a lot of people in your mentions were like, oh, you guys made fun of him because you didn't have a rebuttal. No, we've rebutted it a bunch of times like it didn't bear repeating. And it, it just goes back to, again, you watched him play. You started watching basketball in 1980. Basically, your entire beginning of your basketball watching career is colored by Michael Jordan. There's nothing we can say to change your mind. So why try? Well, and so many sports fans, even in a larger sense, define their sense of self in a lot of ways by certain sporting events they use as markers throughout their lifetime. A lot of do-you-remember-when moments for people were at sporting events, were at marquee sporting events in the career of their fandom. And so when you know you end up looking back on your life and defining it in certain ways, we get a lot of this that comes to mind. Remember? Oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember that. And that should be noted that while people, listen, we were having a bit of fun with him because the guy was kind of ridiculous, and that's you know, what you do when a caller grandstands for half the segment. But I, I don't mean this from a malicious place because that's just human nature to want to hold on to what is yours, to hold on to memories that are near and dear to you. But it comes with the territory, and all I ask is that people acknowledge that a little bit because there seems to be some of that where we acknowledge very openly that we are prisoners of the moment, that we are trying to enjoy what we've got right now because it'll be gone before we know it. LeBron James is 32 years old. We are going to stare down life after LeBron James soon, but life after LeBron James' prime is going to have to come at some point, and Father Time would probably dictate that that's sooner than later. So I'm never going to begrudge anyone for enjoying the present moment I just want the people who are enjoying the past and relishing in that to make that same sort of acknowledgement. Thank you for listening to the first and last podcast. You can listen and subscribe to all ESPN podcasts in the listen tab of the ESPN app. First and last.